this is little Elsie. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's be glad and rejoice in it. Today is February the 21st, 2020. Yesterday was 2020. Boy. Anyway, um, I wanted to read a story that I found this morning, and I thought it was pretty neat. And um, so here it goes. It says, The Goose Story. Next fall, when you see geese heading south for the winter, flying along in a V formation, you might be interested in knowing what science has discovered about why they fly that way. It has been learned that as each bird flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the bird immediately following it. By flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds at least 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew on its own. People who share common direction and sense of community can get where they are going quicker and easier because they are traveling on the thrust of one another. Whenever a goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and resistance of trying to go it alone and quickly gets into formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird immediately in front. If we have as much sense as a goose, we will stay in formation with those who are headed the same way we are going. When the lead goose gets tired, he rotates back in the wing and another goose flies point. It pays to take turns doing hard jobs. The geese honk from behind to encourage those up front to keep up their speed. An encouraging word goes a long way. Finally, when a goose gets sick or is wounded by a gunshot and falls out, two geese fall out of formation and follow him down to help and protect him. They stay with him until he is either able to fly or until he is dead. And they launch out on their own or with another formation to catch up with the group. If we have the scent of a goose, we will stand by each other like that. And author is unknown. So, um, I uh, just had read this earlier, but I decided to stop the video because I wanted to do look up a name of somebody because I'm going to tell you why in a second. But my, um, <clears throat> but, uh, my uh, daughter's boyfriend told me who is a soldier. He told me that that it reminded him of the military that uh you know they stuck by each other and they had one come to the common goal you know and that kind of touches my heart because i uh feel like hey if i just read it for him that's that's great i i'm, a, I'm very happy about that so anyway why i stopped the video i was trying to remember a a, a, a note remember a fella's name Yesterday I was at work and uh, and uh, this fella came in to my work and he he works for the WWE. <coughs> hey, stop! And his name is Braun Strowman. If you look him up, Braun Strowman. Uh, many of you may know him, but it was really cool. He he encouraged me. You know, he I said have a great day, and you guys, and uh, he winked at me. So I'm like, whoa. <laughs> You look him up. They call him the monster. I noticed on a video, they call him the monster, you know. He's just, I mean, he's, he's a huge guy, you know. But sweet, you know, real sweet. I can tell he's a sweet person. Hey, you guys, you getting all excited? Well, yeah. Okay. All right, so that's a cute story, right? The Braun, uh, the goose story, the Braun story. <laughs> all right, so let's exercise. Oh, I did want to mention... I was watching a video that really touched my heart. President Trump was talking about his brother who had alcohol problems. His name was Fred, but Trump looked up to him. Donald looked up to Fred, and um, and, and uh, Fred always told him, Donald, don't ever, he was older than him. He said, don't smoke and don't drink. No, don't drink is the main thing, and don't smoke, he told him. He added that. And, and so Donald never had a cigarette never had a drink in his life and I said that was so encouraging and Do Donald was trying to say 
don't just don't start it won't be hard if you just don't start so always encourage your children and tell and he said that fred told him all the time don't drink and don't smoke and he just kept telling him that and kept telling him that so encourage your kids encourage your kids to not drink and not to smoke because it can be uh the monkey on your back for your whole life so um anyway you don't want that and you know it was a very encouraging video. I was just like, wow, that's so encouraging. I want to share it. I'm going to tell, talk about it. And I'm going to continue to say, don't drink and don't smoke on these videos. And that's that. And so, actually, I also found out about a guy named Ram Das. I believe how you say it. I can't always remember his name. But Ram Das, I think. Uh, yeah, Ram Das. R-A-M, then D-A-S-S. -S. And apparently he's pretty famous, but uh, but anyway, I was reading my Dr. Wayne Dyer book, and he was in there too. So uh, we're gonna play him, and it's about addiction. I said, oh, perfect. So I don't want to make this too long. Let's uh, let's go ahead, just exercise with me. Let's just work out our bodies a little bit. All right, and um, my doggies are all feisty this morning. So let's get feisty. Let's encourage one another. Encourage one another. Ooh, I'm all encouraged, you know. Like I said, seeing that bronze fella, muscles everywhere. He's huge. He's so strong. And, oh, man, what an encouragement to see somebody like that. You know, makes you want to go work out. And that's what I'm doing. So here we go. Y'all ready? Let's do it. Tummy's in. Derriere under. Here we go. When we were born, like, um, uh... Elizabeth Spring Dow, who was born here yesterday. We come into the world, we come from being fully at home and feeling that release that comes. We have a little shadow of it when we come home at the end of the day, those of you that have a home, and put your feet up or relax or have a cup of tea or whatever that is, that feeling of coming home or coming to a safe space or feeling back at peace or at one. And when we get separated from that, which, and that separation, I want to keep reiterating, is created by the mind. That's what the basic issue of the ignorance that is the root of suffering that the Buddha keeps pointing out. The basic root of suffering is thought, the clinging of the mind to things which separate one from all of it. Now, once that separation has occurred, there is incredible pain. We can call it being thrown out of the Garden of Eden. We can call it original sin, whatever you want to call that. I mean, there are different metaphors within different systems. But there is incredible pain. And in some profound way, all of our actions henceforth are an attempt to return to that being, for me, under Maharaji's blanket, or in the heart of God, or in the hand, or being the one, coming back into the one. And we develop a whole set of techniques that we say make us feel good, make us give us a feeling for the moment of, yeah, ah. And some of those give us that moment so intensely, and the rest of our life is so, so much pain of our separateness and so devoid of that feeling that once we find one of those things, for example, it might be a moment of sexual orgasm. It might be a moment of surfing when you transcend the dualism between you and nature. It could be when you're doing something like cooking, the way you turn into just the joy of the process. It could be, it could be any number of things. It could be any number of things. Um, that when that occurs, and it works, it's, it reinforces 
the behavior and you start to do that behavior more and more because it feels good. It takes away the pain of the separateness. And the use of drugs, the use of material possessions, the use of relationships, all of it. When you get busy and get obsessed with relationships and wanting to get closer and closer to somebody, it is trying to get to the place where you come back into that oneness. It is it's that yearning, and you can feel it permeate the universe of people's consciousness. So, when you look at addictions from that point of view, you see that it's not like evil, it is just an attempt to get back. The problem is that most behaviors that get you back, it's like what Maharaja said about drugs, he said, it will allow you to be in the presence of Christ, but you can only stay two hours. He said it would be better to become Christ than visit him. And that's what you find out with most addictive things, that they give you a short rush, but they don't allow you to remain at home. They just allow you the taste of it. And then the minute you get thrown out because you weren't wearing the wedding garment, the minute you go back to heaven but you can't stay because you didn't come in through the right way, you end up feeling like I did something wrong, I'm bad. And then that starts a reaction of mind, so that you get, you come down, then you feel guilt, I must be bad, I should have done something else, why didn't I do the practices that would have allowed me to stay there, rather than the thing that's short term, because you see your predicament. What happens is that the, the opportunity for the immediate gratification, it's like what's called the, in the psychology, the choice of the the little candy bar now or the big candy bar later. And with, with little children, they'll always grab for the little candy bar now because they want what they can get now. They don't, they don't have any delay of gratification. And spiritual practices compared to having sex or compared to taking coke or something is more like delayed gratification versus immediate gratification. So. When you start to stand back and see your predicament and see what you're doing, there is a way from a spiritual perspective in which you begin with that slight bit of awareness to extricate yourself from the chain of reactivity that we're talking about. The chain of reactivity that goes from, I'm feeling this hunger, and then I'll go for the gratification, and then, ah, oh, and then the coming down, and then, oh shit, and then I should have done it the other way, I and then this yet. bad, and there's a whole chain of thoughts that go on. Every one of those is just keeping the whole process going. And as you develop the spaciousness, you start to look at where you can intervene in the process of the sequence that goes on. As the awareness gets deeper, you intervene at different places in the sequence. For example, the yearning, the hunger starts. And like for me, for example, I can, I've had strong addictions to food. So that when I am feeling unloved, I'll eat and I'll get fat. It's a pattern. And then I'll hate myself loathing because of my body and so on and I'll go through it. Now I understand the psychodynamics of that at one level, but let's take it from this point of view of the mind for a moment. The first place I began to intervene was when Manindra, my meditation teacher, said, Ram Das, don't you see that it's just old karma running off? And I began to break in at the point that after I had eaten too much to reduce my anxiety because my mother fed me food when I was upset and I learned that pattern and all that stuff, I start to, instead of going into I'm no good and revulsion and all the sequence, I break the chain at that point and then I just go back into my spiritual practices. Okay, instead of carrying out that whole sequence, I, I shortcut there. As the witness gets stronger, you start to go back in the chain further and further into... I wanted to tell you a couple things. Um, 
first of all, I, I haven't listened to this video, so if it comes out with some stuff, I don't know, I don't know, I'm sorry, okay? Uh, so far, I'm still going to play the video, but um, if it gets too rough, I'll stop it. <laughs> all right, so the other thing I want to tell you, I've been trying the last few days, and it seems to work, is like, so... You never know what tomorrow brings when it comes to food, right? So you never know what you're going to be exposed to, what what kind of food or what have you. And, um, lately I said, what can I do? You know, I'm, uh, I decided to every, break up my day into three, you know, like morning, lunch, and dinner. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So breakfast, you know, in that time period between uh, when you wake up till noon, I can have 600 calories, and then that's it. I'm done for the that part of the day. Then the next part of the day, I can have 600 calories from 12 to 6. And then from 6 to midnight, same thing. I try to gauge my calories to be just 600, no more, for my body. That's, you guys might be able to live happily on, you know, more than that, 2,000, you know, divided by 3. Just break it up. But... The point is, it has been working, and and then I just try to remember I shouldn't go over 600. Hey, if I go over a little bit, it's okay, but at least I have that goal of sticking around 600 calories every time I eat, and then I don't worry about it, whatever I ate, I just, it's all gone after i um, you know done with that 600 calories or done with that part of the day, and uh, you don't worry about it, you don't worry about anything, because you kind of just gotta keep yourself in, under that control, okay? I thought I would share that because you don't have to worry about overeating when you kind of gauge yourself like that. You'll be satisfied. You'll know you won't have to go hungry. You won't have to diet. I mean, it seems to be working. And you can eat really whatever you want. And for me, you know, it's been really hard. I've been trying to be a vegetarian, but it just doesn't work always for me. You know, the food ain't available, whatever, whatever. So, and it is very comforting sometimes when you eat meat I, you know like a chicken soup or whatever you know so I've been under the weather and I made myself some chicken soup and yeah it's not vegan you know I'm a vegetarian but anyway so but it's okay all right so guys I just wanted to share that because he was talking about overeating and you won't overeat in this in this thing because you know you'll never have to go hungry and you kind of have a plan and it really works and it's kind of helping me keep my weight uh where I want it uh, I'm not even going to weigh myself for a while, so I don't get discouraged or anything like that. And I am just uh, trying this, and it's really, really, really working because you can pretty much decide, eat, eat whatever you want as long as it's around 600 calories, you know? And it don't have to be exact, so remember that. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. Come on. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm sorry, guys. As the dis the separateness right, is starting here. to come and the feeling of hunger, and as you're about to eat, you start to notice the fact that you're about to do that, and you your mind anticipates the whole sequence, and you in a sense begin to see the emptiness of the form you're about to take. Now, if you try to stop it too soon using your mind to stop it, there's a residual backlash from it. So. I, mean, I hope I'm not condensing. This is I'm trying to give a lot of teaching very fast. I mean, as I understand it, as I've learned, worked with it, that one develops a lot of patience and a lot of gentleness with oneself. And for generally, when people come to me with addictions, I'm inclined to say, start doing spiritual practices. Start doing the studies that will allow you to see yourself in a new way, that will allow you to understand what that hunger is you're feeding in a new way, to just get a little different perspective on it. Don't worry about the addiction. It will fall away when it will fall away. And when you do it again, just notice it. And the, one, the line I always use, how poignant I am. How poignant the human condition. You know, I'm so gentle with myself. And what I have watched is the patterns of my obsessions and addictions have changed over time. There's no doubt about that. And yet I didn't deal with them directly head on for the most part. 
Because what you see is, and this is something that I'm sure I, I create a lot of waves in many people, including people that I love very dearly, that I'm close to, I see that a lot of the programs to deal with addiction end up creating a new addiction to being not addicted that is as bad as the addiction itself. That I mean, when you meet somebody that says, I haven't smoked in three years, two months, ten days, and four hours, you realize that their mind is as stuck as their mind was stuck in smoking. Maybe they won't die of cancer, but they'll probably die of tightness. I mean, I, I'm being a little facetious, but in general I'm saying that dealing with dealing with things that are which you're caught in, the minute you start to stop them, you invest them in a way. And so my suggestion is that you just keep cultivating the practices. And every time you don't see when I if I get up in the morning and I got up and I decided to stay in the dream state and not get up to do my sitting, that could start a whole sequence of you're no good, you'll never get to God. But in the time I'm saying you're no good, you never get to God, I could have been doing mantra. And when I realized, and I began to sit in meditation and watch the sequence of my behavior, I saw that all my recriminations didn't help anything in particular. They weren't really functional, except trying to make me feel comfortable with myself. And the better thing would be, the minute I notice that I've lost it, or I've gotten caught, or I'm stuck, or I just start to do something. Just pick up a holy book, do a mantra, think of Maharaji, whatever, sing a song. I mean, I'll start driving to town, and I'm going to give a, a lecture, and I start to get uptight. Okay? Oh my God, do I know what I'm going to talk about? You know, and it's all, it's a neurotic pattern. I know it from years back. It's my, I mean, I can give you a whole psychodynamic storyline about what that's about. I look at it and I think, ah, oh, there it is. At that moment, I start, Sri Guru Charana Sarojara Jani Jamanu Muguru Sudari Varano Raghubara Bhimala Jasu Jod. And six minutes later, I'm in a different space than I was before. Now you could say from a psychological that's denial, you should work with that. But the fact is that thus far what's happening is it's getting less and less and I'm able to hang in here now with very little of that old anxiety that used to be crippling. It used to be crippling. I've worked with some of it, but psychologically, but a lot of it is just, it's become uninteresting. It's just become uninteresting. And I just flip gears immediately. I flip gears. Because the minute you get lost in identification with your personality, to the exclusion of identification with your soul. Right. That's what's happening. You've lost it. You've lost it. And there are a thousand times each day you lose it. And if you get caught in your soul to the exclusion of your personality, you lost it equally as much. And that's the balance of us as human beings. Next question. This has been quite a process. I keep asking questions and then I get an answer. Of course, that's all I am. <laughs> sure I so I keep rewriting my question. <laughs> no doubt if I sit with this question, I get the answer too. Uh, but my most current question is... Uh, Recognition that I feel like I'm in a codependent relationship with God. <laughs> so what that means to me is that all the way that I know uh, about relationship, about uh, looking outside of myself and efforting and trying to uh, to get someone to want me and to love me and respond to me. But the way that I do that in relationship is basically how I see my relationship to God. And I don't feel like the way that my personality is organized right now that I can experience God coming back to me wanting me and loving me and accepting me. It's just the dynamic that seems to be really strong, strongly operating in 
in me right now. And when I think about uh, how to do that with relationship, I would I would say that my work is to pull back and to not be so yeah. outer focused and to let relationship come to me. Um, but the question I have in relationship to God, it gets a little more nebulous. It's not very concrete. And I'm wondering how to be in relationship with God and what's God's part? What's his role? What's his responsibility to me to, uh, to come into relationship? I think you're demonstrating what you're saying, the way in which um, psychodynamics are reflected in the way in which we perceive the spiritual journey. And that you're writing the spiritual journey as a, a large version of what you're dealing with in the psychodynamics in your personality life. And I... Um, Um, there are a number of ways that um, appear to deal with what you're talking about. Um, in, in understanding the dynamics of dualism, the dualistic practice of experiencing um, experiencing her as separate from you, um, experiencing God as separate, um, you can project into that which is beyond all forms, any form you want. So you can pro project into it the form of a father, the form of a judge, the form of a rejecter, the form of a non-lover, the form of a caring person, the form of somebody reaching out, the form of somebody who's waiting for you to reach out. These are all projections of the human mind. Because all right, God guys. Is so if you want to finish that video, so you're making of it what you it's wish. It's called. Um, and it's in a way. Let me find um, it. You're facing so much that you keep wanting to give it form, and the forms you choose to <laughs> give it are based on the Sorry. what you need in symbiosis to your own needs and your own separateness. And um, so you always end up. Okay, so it's called Overcoming Addiction and Attachment Attachment by Ram Das. R-A-M-D-A-S-S. -S, and that is on YouTube. It's called Overcoming Addiction and Attachment. Ram Das. R-A-M-D-A-S-S. -S. You all have a blessed day. I hope you feel better. And remember, so, you know, encourage one another. And... Fly information with other people. Try to get along with people. And, you know, when you say they have the same goal, are we all have the goal to go to heaven? Uh, we all want to get there someday. And find a church. Find a church. Catholic preferred. <laughs> but um, anyway, find a church to uh, support you in that mission, in that goal. Peace, guys. God bless you.